Inside this video right here, we're gonna talk about exactly how to best move your patient so your patient has success and you don't get hurt. Let's dive into it. I want to help decrease failure rates for NREMT, for EMT school, for paramedic school. Watch these videos, watch this content, and believe me, you will start to understand EMS medicine. Anybody out there that wants to serve their community as an EMT or a paramedic should be able to do that. And I'm here as a paramedic coach to help you achieve that. Hey everyone, it's the Paramedic Coach and I want to personally welcome you to my YouTube channel. We do weekly EMS videos here, usually about at least two to three a week here at the Paramedic Coach. Now, we also do live streams as well, so be sure to stay tuned for those. If you're new here, be sure to hit subscribe and for everyone watching this video, smash that like button to help support my channel and let's dive into today's video, which is everything patient movement for the EMT. Here we go. Now, we got a few things we're gonna talk about. Stretcher, stair chair, bed transfer, a scoop stretcher, a long backboard. These are the main tools that are used to move the patient. Now, some of you are saying, oh wait, there's more. What about this one, about this one, about that one? I'm with you on that. These are the main stay things you need to be an expert at. And that's why I'm making this video. If you don't know these at an expert level, you're in big trouble. So the first thing I want to talk about here is going to be the stretcher. Now, depending on what stretcher you have, there's a few different types. Some auto load into the ambulance all by themselves. Some require you to lift up when you're going into the ambulance, but there's buttons to make the pressure go up and down when the patient's on it. Some require full manual movement of the patient, okay, as well. Now, here's what I get first thing I need to tell you about is first things first. With any of these things, if you're ever at all uncomfortable about being able to lift a patient, you gotta do two things. Number one, it's okay to call for help, especially with a bariatric patient. That's what you should be doing, okay? Because if you hurt yourself, then we're at a commission and you can't help the patient and then everything goes downhill. Number two is you need to do the right training physically for the job, okay? And not a lot of programs go over this, which is why I'm making a YouTube video on it, okay? Now, the stretcher operation, the most important thing is the trigger man, okay? Who's at the trigger? That's gonna be the main communication, the person at the trigger of moving that stretcher. So if I'm here and I'm at the trigger, okay, and I'm getting ready to roll here, I'm at the, I'm at the, at the trigger, what that means is this. Everything goes on my say because I'm gonna be the one with the trigger to move this patient. We have to manually lift up and down. You should have direct eye contact with the, with the person, your partner, at the other end, the head of the stretcher. So here we go, we're getting, here we go. Okay, ready? And then we're gonna go into it, okay? That's how you do it, okay? The same thing applies with all these when we talk about eye contact. So if I'm doing a stair chair, you shouldn't be looking at the patient while you're doing the stair chair. You should be looking at your partner as you're moving down the stairs, okay? That's what you wanna be doing, right? You don't wanna be looking at the patient while looking at your partner as you're moving down, okay? Or, or at a second glance, be watching the glide of the stairs. That's all fine too, depending on how you're doing it, if you're gliding or lifting. Now, a stretcher is your main mode of transport for the patient. So, what this means? Well, if you find a patient outside laying in the grass, right? The patient could be moved to the stretcher and brought in the ambulance. The stair chair is utilized when the patient's on a different floor. I'm coming to you from somewhere not on the first floor. What does that mean? Well, that means, let's just say, for example, there's no elevator, right? And you have only stairs to get down. You got to do stairs. Well, if the elevator is broken, you got to use stairs. What if you have a second story of a home where the bedroom is most commonly used? That patient may have to go from the bed to the stair chair, then down to ground level outside the home, then go to stretcher, then go in the ambulance. That's how you do it, okay? Now, a scoop stretcher is pretty cool. 
That's for somebody who's basically on the ground and has an easier way of mode of transportation to lift them. This is also utilized in when you have a long distance or out in a field, maybe to carry somebody it would be at the scoop stretcher. Depending on where you practice, this scoop stretcher may be used a lot or once in a blue moon, but it's a great tool and I highly recommend it. The long backboard is utilized in other departments for quick maneuvers. The long backboard used to be used to stabilize someone's back. Not so much anymore. There may be some areas that still do that. I'm not sure. Again, I don't know the whole world. But what I do know is this. Um, the long backboard, in my opinion, should only be used to roll a patient onto the board, get them on the board, to get them to the stretcher. But when you think about it, doesn't the scoop do the same thing? Yeah, it kind of does. So what's the point of this long backboard? Hey, I don't run, I don't run every little thing, but what I can tell you is this, this is the main modes of everything. Now, stair chair, there's two main things. We can lift the patient and go down the stairs, or we can glide down the stairs. Whenever you can glide, there's tracks to open up and glide down the stairs. There's not much work to be done. You have to maintain the proper tilt going down the stairs and hold it on that, on that angle. That's about it. There's no real lifting involved. You're just gliding the patient down. You need to be in a secure stance though still. And the main thing I can tell you is really use your legs. If you use your legs and use the big muscles in your body, you're gonna be in good shape. You start using your back, that's when you're gonna be in trouble. Use your legs, okay? Now, the stretcher operation. The best way to load a stretcher, depending on where you're at and what stretcher you have, um, if you have the ones with the plus and minus, which they automatically go up and down, okay? A lot of places will say to do a two-person lift, right? Now here's my thoughts on a two-person lift going into the ambulance. A two-person lift going into the ambulance is great if both people are about of equal strength. But if you do a two-person lift and one person is really weak or timing is off and one is really strong, you have to be able to match the, it's all about matching the force going up. So if one person goes straight up, the other one's struggling to get up, when you're doing that lift up into the ambulance, if you're lifting the patient into the ambulance, that's all good and fine, but you gotta match each other's strength and timing. So if someone's really strong and may have to wait and not go up as fast, so everything tilts to one side. So be careful on that, okay? The stair chair operation, now, you may be transporting a patient back to home on an IFT transfer. She so might be taking a patient on a stair chair to go back up the stairs. The same thing, the same thing applies here. The same thing applies here. But what I can tell you is going back up is harder than going back down. Easier to roll tracks down and lift up. Bed transfer. Now bed transfer, some EMS agencies will have a, a transfer sheet. The, common, the most common one I've seen is a dark blue bed transfer sheet. The patient is laying supine, let's say I was laying in bed supine, you need to roll the patient over, do you tuck the sheet under them, roll them back, then roll them back on this side, pull the sheet out this way, so now the sheet is on both sides. That's how you do it. The sheet will have handles on it, and then you're able to move the patient out. Here's what I do when I move the patient out of bed. I don't go from the middle of the bed all the way over to the stretcher. What I commonly do is if I'm here, okay, and I'm on this side and the stretcher's in front of me, I gotta go here and pull. What I will do is get the patient to the edge of the bed first, right at the edge of the bed. Then my partner will come on that bed, get as close as you can. The closer you are, the better you have of getting a good grasp. Then complete the last step, so it's a two-step process, instead of a one-step process, okay? Doesn't matter how strong you are, okay? You want to make it safe. What's the one biggest tip I can give you about lifting and moving patients? Well, here it is. It's about communication with your partner. You need to be in direct, precise, crisp communication with your partner at all times during patient movement. Now, if you just watch this video and you are someone who's preparing for EMS at all levels, or if you're someone in school right now who's struggling, or somebody right now who's trying to understand the why behind what they do, trying to pass their NREMT, whether it's EMT, advanced, or paramedic, I'm gonna put a link in the description down below. The first link will be to my program at prepareforeems.com. 
You'll get access to over 160 videos in my video audio vault, plus access to a private community where you get access to me directly inside a private community group. So you can watch the video on there, it's about 10 minutes long, it explains everything you need to know, and I want to thank you for all the kind words and comments. Smash that like button, make sure to subscribe, and I will see you all next time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you then. Oh, like everything that you were saying was just connecting all these, all these, you know, links inside my brain. And I, I just knew right then and there, um, I have to have this program. I have to have all the information that he's willing to give. I need all of it. I went through it. I, I spent the time and money in other areas. And I'm, I'm just going to let you guys know that uh, this was everything I was searching for the whole time. The first couple of videos I watched, um, when I noticed it, it just, I, I just immediately started connecting dots um, on some of these things I, I didn't have grasped. Went on there, then I continued reviewing, and I did it for about a month, and you know, it, it helped a lot. Like I said, even after school, and I took that test one time, and I passed it. Your particular program, you have your students engaging, and you have your students discussing, and you have your students actually using your products. And I'm seeing time and time again, um, students that are coming in and announcing their new certification with National Registry. Adults obviously passing the exam, doing it pretty quickly, 70 questions in about an hour. Um, well, you definitely are like how your videos are. Like I wasn't sure how it was gonna be, but you are how you, your videos are. So that was awesome. So people who are getting ready for paramedic school, or if you're getting ready to go in the Navy as a corpsman or as an Army medic, um, you gotta prepare yourself. Evan, I know you've got a program that helps people prepare that way. So bottom line is guys, you don't ever wanna hear something for the first time with a bunch of other students. So if you're in a competitive learning environment, you don't wanna hear about AFib for the first time where everybody else, you wanna have an understanding of it before you walk in the room. From 120 questions, passing two sections, um, near passing one, and then I think two below passing, two seven questions passing Sorry, completely. $7,000 for school plus everything else that you put into it all the time and all the time off work and family and everything. It's to see people fail and fail and fail and then just quit, which I know a couple of people who have. I tend to say, you know, it doesn't hurt to have somebody right there to talk to, you know, send a question. Anytime I get the chance, I, I will gladly offer or advise them to sign up for you and your paramedic coach. It's, it's truly helpful and amazing at what you do. I want to help decrease failure rates for NREMT, for EMT school for paramedic school. Watch these videos, watch this content, and believe me, you will start to understand EMS medicine. Anybody out there that wants to serve their community as an EMT or a paramedic should be able to do that, and I'm here as a paramedic coach to help you achieve that.